So next up is Hannah Eden. I don't remember when exactly we met you, but whenever, I'm sorry, but whenever I have to explain her, I'm like, oh, she's like the top trainer at Nordic Track, so whenever you get on like one of those treadmills or anything, she's one of the people there. She's been in the fitness industry forever, used to have bright red hair is how I knew you originally, um, but that's not what I tell people, right? Like, that's not what I told Keaton. Keaton doesn't let people stay at his house, like just random people. They have to like really, really mean something. And I was like, every time I get around you and Paulo, I'm like, I like you guys more. Like the conversation gets better as time goes on. And it's really, really cool. Um, great friend of Dana, great friend of everybody. Uh, and you have it, Hannah Eden. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. And before I start rambling on here, I just want to give a massive thank you to Keaton and to Rob and to Dana and to Maddie and to everyone else that's put this entire event on and for all of you guys for being here. So for those of you that do know who I am, thank you. <laughs> and those of you that don't, um, I guess I'll give you a quick intro. So my name is Hannah Eden. I'm 31 years old, born and raised in England, but moved here to the United States when I was 16. Rough, rough road, tough situation there, that's for sure. And just to put things in perspective for now being recognized as this fitness professional that runs across the world and does all these things, that wasn't the destiny for me. When I moved here at 16, I was actually dating a convicted felon that was in jail and I was a piece of shit, to say, for lack of better terms, right? I wasn't a great person, definitely didn't have this drive to try and see what else I could do in my life, what I could see what I could do with my mind. But the reason why I'm telling you that is because a lot can change and everyone that has been on this stage today has said the same thing and I truly believe that. So at 19, I met my husband, which is Paolo, back of the room, my homie, my soulmate. And at 23 was the first time that we stepped inside of the world of business. We opened up our first gym um, based off of angry motivation, which is something I don't suggest that you do because you will burn out. It was to try and prove other people wrong and show them what I can do and I don't need you in my life to get that kind of deal. And since then, we've done a few other things. We have had that gym since 2015. We actually closed that at the peak of the pandemic. And in 2017, we decided to open up a online training platform, which has had many different stages of evolution to get to where it is now, where we have thousands of people around the room that do our training, around the world, sorry, that do our training. With that, we also did FYR Apparel, which is our apparel company, and a podcast and certain things that I get to do as an individual, which I'm super grateful for, working for other brands, working for Reebok, Men's Health, Women's Health, Nordic Track, um, a lot of other things which I'll talk about in this talk today. But one of the things that stood out to me the most out of all, this, all of this was that I'm not any different than you guys, and neither is anyone else that has the stage here today. And as I was preparing myself to talk to all of you, a few questions came onto my mind, which I will share with you. The first one was, why are all of you here, right? Why did you travel near and far to get here into this hangar, which is fucking epic if you ask me, so props to you, dude. And I think the answer is because you all want to become limitless, which is the idea of what this is, or clear, calculated, and ambitious. This, this vertical union of trying to level up your lives. And then I asked myself why I'm here and why all the guests that are here on the stage to talk to you today are here as well. And I think the one thing that we've all figured out, which you can too, and I hope that I can't teach you anything, but I can inspire and share experiences and stories, are that we've managed to unlock this place in our brain where we don't give a fuck. We know exactly who we are, and we know exactly what we're here to do. And I tried to think of a different couple terms on how you would describe what being limitless or successful or clear, calculated, ambitious could mean. And I am super interested in psychology, and you'll learn a lot about that, about me, as I continue to tell you a little bit about my story. But there was a couple things that I landed on. And the first one, for my definition, was total human optimization. To really, truly see what we can do as individuals. But that kind of has like this physical attachment to it, and then I landed on this, which is what hit for me, and I think will hit for all of you. And I was like, fuck, yeah, I killed it. Which is self-actualization. And I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but this has been around from the 1900s. And self-actualization actually sits on top of this pyramid. But it doesn't start there, it starts at the bottom. 
And it is a motivational theory that Maslow came up with and is trying to understand what motivates some people and what doesn't for others. Why do some people have this ability to chase after these unstoppable dreams and why some people don't? We're having full construction in our house right now and we've met some really cool people. And the work is in my house. I'm like, why the fuck doesn't this guy have his own company? He has every single skill. He knows how to do drywall, he knows how to paint, he knows how to do flooring, he knows how to change light bulbs, he knows how to do all these things. Why is he, I'm hearing him argue over $20. He has all the skill set that we need to make this house happen, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why is there a GC involved? And that piques my interest, and it's piqued my interest over years, is why do some people have the drive to want more out of life and some don't? And then we go back to that theory. And on the bottom of that triangle, number one is physiological needs. What motiva motivates us to want to do something. And that physiological need starts with water, air, food, the shit that we need to survive. And number two is safety. Like our personal safety, that we have resources, we have employment and we're feeling good. After that is love and belonging, which is where your friendships come into play, the intimacy that you have in your life and the sense of wanting to feel like you're part of a community. And then the, number, the next one over that, which is number four, is esteem. And that's where I feel like a lot of you guys are at, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Which is recognition, notoriety, and really trying to empower yourself. And then the one above that is self-actualization. And the de definition, according to Maslow, is the desire to become the most that one can be which self-actualization is the highest level of psychological development where one realizes their personal potential after their bodily and ego needs are met, which are all of those things I just listed underneath. So I don't know if these guys are aware of the fact that they are seeking self-actualization, whether it be through an apparel company, whether it be through a TV show that does these crazy fucking truck renovations, whether it be through Lions and Sheep, whether it be through DLB Daily, whether it be through Christian Guzman and Alpha Land, all of these things are because they're trying to seek to see what else they can become. What else can I do once I've reached this level of excellence? And for me, I have generated millions of dollars. That's cool, but that's not enough for me. I wanna know what the fuck I can do not just in the business space, but in the way that I can impact the world and also to see what I can do with my body. So I wanna share some stories and some pretty crazy shit that I've done in my life. And I wanna share the thoughts and the ideas that were going through my mind. And my proudest accomplishment, which is also really hard for me to talk about in public and I will definitely cry, so just bear with me, was this mission that I did. <laughs> which was 828.6 miles running and cycling around the entire country of Iceland. But before this idea came up, I was actually introduced without even knowing what this meant. And a lot of you guys might know Matthew Vincent that was here at the last event. There's this thing called a misogi, which I didn't even know that it was. These guys are doing misogis without even knowing it. I discovered recently what this is. And a misogi in Japan is a thing that they do. It's a spiritual thing where they wash themselves down with cold water. And when you do a Masogi challenge, you go to a waterfall that has been frozen and you stand underneath it and you let this water destroy you in your face. It's extremely uncomfortable and it should seem like it's gonna, well, it will hurt. It's gonna be long and grueling. But the idea behind a Masogi challenge is that you do something at one point in your life that the effects of that challenge itself will trickle over to other parts of your life without even realizing it. But my first unintentional experience of a misogi was back in 2017, where I was actually invited as a guest with um, Ashley Horner. A lot of you guys might know who she is. And she was doing this mission to run 230 miles through Haiti. And she's like, yeah, you wanna do it with me? I was like, fuck yeah, I wanna do that with you. But I had, my ego was barking. I didn't train, I was fit, I was an athlete, I was strong. I could move heavy stuff quickly, and I wanted to move fast and heavy. But running, you can't transfer skills, and you can't transfer like the, the talent that you own in certain modalities in the fitness industry. It just doesn't work. Well, I did that. 
It was her mission, I supported it. It was an incredible experience. But the most frustrating part about it was that I couldn't get to the point of testing my mind because my body broke down before I got there. Meaning every step I took, I felt like my ankles were crumbling into pieces. The pain in my hips were, is just insane. And I remember thinking, this sucks. I don't even know what my limits are because I didn't have the chance to get there. Fast forward, seven months goes by. And I'll give you as much detail as I feel comfortable with this. But when we had finished Haiti, which was for the Mason Fortune orphanage, it was the most meaningful moment, I think, in my life to that point. It was the last mile that we ran, all of these orphans met us on the bridge. And they ran with us. They had no shoes on. All of them had no parents. And I got to see something that was so powerful and the amount of money that we were able to raise for that event was incredible. Then seven months goes by and I remember the last night at the, at the orphanage, we were joking. And I'm like, dude, what's next? Let's run around Iceland. It's like this joke. Cool. We put it under the table, we move on with our life. And then seven months goes by and I get the hardest phone call of my life, which was from one of my best friends at the time. And uh, her name was Jessica, and her husband's name was Jeff. And she's like, well, Jeff told us, Jess has been diagnosed with stage four terminal cancer. And there's a bit of a kicker here, because she was six months pregnant, and she had a two-year-old at home chatting. And I remember thinking, are you fucking kidding me? At that point in my life, my career was popping. I'm doing all the things, getting all these business deals, I'm getting programs in men's health, I'm getting my own DVD with women's health, I'm working for bodybuilding.com, I'm filming the first follow-along video ever, everything's going great. And then I get this one piece of news and I'm like, oh, just rock to my core. I'd also been building my social media platform, so I'm like, fuck, well, I built this brand on authenticity and sharing, like Christian was saying, all the shit that's going on in my life, whether it's relative to fitness or not. What do I do with this piece of news that is so private, is so fragile, and to be honest, I didn't want to tell anyone. I wanted to like delete the app on Instagram and, and try and just support and do whatever I could to try and help in this other situation. But I didn't. I went to the hospital and I spoke to Jess and I'm like, man, for me and for everyone that is here and I'm sure for a lot of you guys, we're all control freaks, which is why we want to control our own life, which is why we want to curate our own story and not tell not allow someone else to tell us how we should live our lives. That's the difference, and I think that's what entrepreneurship is, which is why we don't get sucked into the system of just being this robot, right? And when I got to the hospital, it became very clear that shit was going south real quick. Things were not good. Jess was extremely ill. And to be honest, I think now that she has gone, she was already gone. She had given up in all hope that, that she was going to be able to beat this thing. And I remember thinking like, fuck man, this is not the person that I know. This couple, they've been together for 10 years. They've got this picture perfect life. They've always been these goal oriented people where they have something on their mind, they go and get it. Well now what's the goal, right? There's nothing to work towards. So me and my control freak need of like trying to need to do something because I felt helpless. I came up with this idea in the hospital. I'm like, yo, I need you to have a goal that you need to put your eyes on and have hope for and look forward towards that because I know you're a goal-oriented person. I'm gonna run and I'm gonna, at first it was, I'm gonna run around the country of Iceland. Then I went home and Googled it and realized it was 828 miles and I was like, maybe I'll add a bicycle to that <laughs> equation as well. So I told her I was gonna do it. And the hope that I saw in her eyes was something that I was like, oh wow, that just got really real. So initially I went home and I called Ashley. I said, hey, I need you. I need you to do this thing with me. Because if I was willing to run with you 230 miles through Haiti, for strangers, I'd never met any of these orphans before, then I need to do something for my best friend. I have to take action here. She was like, yeah, I'm with you. I naively thought and truly believed that Jess was not gonna die at that point. I don't know why. I think that's what we call denial, right? Anyway. After I decided I was gonna do this, I found myself a coach and was like, I'm not gonna allow what happened in Haiti to happen again, which means I need to adapt my body, 
I need to become a runner. I need to become a cyclist. So rather than just saying, oh yeah, I'm gonna do it, sign up and go, and my body breaks down before my mind does, I get myself a coach. And I work really hard for about eight months. Before I got to the eight month mark where I actually began, unfortunately, Jess passed away. And I don't know how you guys operate, but for me, when I'm doing something hard, or when I'm doing something like, that takes this other side of me that I'm not really, I don't really show when I'm vulnerable, which is usually with the people that I love. Initially, I'm like, Paolo, I love you, man, but like, I can't have you on these trips. Because this is where I bring out like that tough motherfucker <laughs> that can grow, go through pain, run through stress fractures, be kind of a psychopath to be able to finish these tasks. And I'm like, man, I can't have you there. I'm sorry. And he's like, all right, cool. So it was gonna be me, it was gonna be Ashley, it was gonna be this whole media crew, we were gonna have all the things there. And then when Jess passed away, things turned very different for me. I'm like, I don't want a media crew there. I don't want anyone there. I'm sorry, Ashley, I, I, it, I was losing sleep over it. I'm like, I can't have you there, man. It's too private and it, there's too much pain right now going on. So I bought Jeff, Jess's husband. I bought Paolo. I bought Jess's niece who raised her, her children and my best friend, Megan. And there's a lot of pain that's going into this story because there's a whole other chapter of it that's happening in our life. They say when it rains, it pours. When Jess passed away on the 27th of March, we were at the hospital picking up her, her death certificate. And I remember walking outside and seeing Paolo on the floor, crying, like hysterically crying. I've been with this guy since I was 19, never seen that before. I'm like, what the fuck's happened? And Jeff goes, his brother just died. And I'm like, what is going on right now? Like, is this even possible? And Megan, the other girl I told you about, three months before, she loses her baby at 26 weeks. I'm like, none of this makes sense. This is so much at once. It's too much to handle. Like, it's just too much. Anyway, you can understand the emotion that was attached to that. We have to fly to Brazil. We have to try and be here. We've got celebration of life for Jess. We're trying to do all these things. And oh, by the way, you're going to go bike and run 828.6 miles in like five days. I'm like, fuck, all right. So I tell Ashley she can't come, which was a really hard decision for me. I invite Paolo and bring everyone along with me. And we do it. And I had been, and I am, extremely type A. And I'm like, all right, if we're gonna do the entire ring road of Iceland, which is what this tattoo is on my hand, the red line is the route that we took, then I need to figure out strategy. And I need to put this and attach this and align this to my training blocks that I've been doing. So I'm there going, on day one, we're gonna do this. On day two, we're gonna do this. On day three, we're gonna do this. And I'm gonna start and finish every day and we're gonna get this done. And the initial goal was eight days. It's just over hundred miles a day consecutively, which if you're chafing, if anyone cycles, that shit fucking sucks. I'm gonna get back on the bike. And day one, and I'm telling you this story because so much came out of it. Lesson number one was this. I truly believe that everyone here, and myself, whether or not we are meant to do it, there's three things, and everyone has their thing, right? Someone says, you, you gotta do these two things to get this mindset. You gotta do these three things to get this mindset. To become, for me, to become and seek self-actualization, and this is gonna sound woo-woo, so like, don't shut down on me, but you need to focus on three areas of your life. Number one being your mind, number two being your body, and number three being your spirit. And when I say mind, I mean that's where like your determination, your discipline, your grit, your mental fortitude, all of that shit that's intangible, that's in here. And when I say your body, I mean your machine, man. The, the fitter and the more tuned your machine is, the more you can do in life. Rob has back issues. I have back issues. When you throw your back out, you're fucked. You're not even gonna be able to run a business that doesn't need your body. You can't move quick. You're always in pain. You're miserable. You're not feeling good. Same thing when you're overweight. People have achy joints. I go travel the world. I get to go and run through all these incredible mountains and I see people drive. They don't get out their car because they're not fit enough. They can't walk and see the most beautiful places that they're 100 meters from because they cannot do it because they're not physically able. There's so much in this life that is out of our control. You know what is in our control? To take care of our mind and to take care of our body. And number three is spirit. And you can decide whether you want to take that as religion, spirituality, whatever you want. But for me, 
Spirit means finding your reason. And that's something that we stand for. That's the name of my apparel company. That's over every single gym wall that we have, all over everything. And that's relative to every individual. And one thing I will say is if you're chasing someone else's reason, you are never gonna succeed. And success means something different to every single person in this room. And if we all got together, we would all have a different definition. And if you ask me at 23 what success meant, it's extremely different than what it is now. To me now, success means being 100% authentic. Not having five different masks that you wear, one at work, you want to wear at home, one at home, you've got one with your friends, and then you've got like this really bitchy mask when you're with your loved one for some reason, right? We all do that. So being truly authentic is successful to me. And yeah, I think that through being truly authentic, you can find success. You can make millions, you can make billions of dollars. But if you're not authentic, something's gonna give at one point. And these are where my lessons come back from Iceland. That was crazy. I'm not a runner, I'm not a cyclist. I don't think it, before that, I don't think I'd cycled more than two miles. But if I had the right mind, the tuned in body, and the right spirit, meaning reason, then you can do whatever the fuck you want. And I've proved that to myself over and over again by committing to these misogies and actually being able to do them. And I'll be honest with you, I never, ever, ever speak out loud about the fear that I'm feeling inside of my mind. Because as soon as it leaves my mouth, it becomes a reality. And that's just what it is. Lesson number two was a really hard lesson that I learned on day four that I think is life-changing and everyone else should take this away from, from, from today. We've got a lot of distance to cover, right? So any extra mile is like not cool for me. I'm tired, I'm exhausted, everything hurts. I actually ended up training a little too hard before I went, started on a stress fracture. My state of mind's all over the place. We just had all this death that happened all of a sudden. And on day four, and I'll set the scene for you, I committed to this challenge. I set all the routes. I got my own bike. On my bike, I have two devices. One that's got my music and my jams on, which was freaking Sandra's Rose with Drake on repeat for eight or nine days. And then the other one had the route, which is where my little blue dot is that I'm supposed to follow. And I remember looking down at one point and we had two different bikes, a road bike and then this gravel bike to whenever the roads weren't paved or something was going down. I remember specifically I was on that mountain bike and it was fucking miserable. Everywhere I was going, I was like getting rocked over here, getting hit in the crush. I'm like, this is not fun. But I persevered and I pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. At one point I looked up, I look at the map. I'm like, oh, you have got to be kidding me. We've been going 12 fucking miles in the wrong direction. I lost my shit. It was the most embarrassing low of the lows that I've ever had in front of my team, my family, my friends. I blew up on everyone. I'm like throwing my bike everywhere, so dramatic. Like, you guys, you have one fucking job. You don't understand what it feels like. Ugh. Going crazy. It was so embarrassing that I did that. Because when I got my ass back on my bike and had hundreds of miles to, com to complete, I had all this time alone with myself to think about what I just did and to also analyze why that problem happened and why it occurred. And the first thing that came to me was this. I'm like, it's everyone else's fault. I'm blaming them for shit that's going wrong, even though they're there because I asked them to be there. I set these routes. I'm in front on my bike going 12 to 13 miles an hour trying to keep my shit together. They're following in an RV. They're following my lead. But I somehow still managed to blame my lack of success on them. And then years go by, I hear this quote, which Kobe got in common, right? He has this quote, which hits me a lot, and everyone should hear this. I have nothing in common with people that blame others for their lack of success. I did that that day. So that lesson is this, own your shit. Someone else said that on the stage today. It's not your mum's fault, it's not your husband's fault, it's not your wife's fault, it's not your kid's fault, it's not your friend's fault. Own your mistakes. Own your mistakes and understand that anything that you do, you're responsible for. Even though maybe on paper you shouldn't be, just own it that way and you can grow from it. And the third one is this. And out of the mind, body and spirit, the mind, I know through testing it, is the most powerful tool that you have. More over your body. And I used to think that the body was number one. But on that trip, I was in an unfathomable amount of pain 
but there's a difference between pain and suffering, right? A lot of the time throughout the day that I was on the bike, I was choosing to suffer. Like I wouldn't feel like an actual thing in my leg or my hip or my back. I was just miserable. That's suffering. Pain is something that's real. I've seen it by watching my best friend die. That's pain. Having a stress fracture that literally like changes your gait, that's pain. When we sit in misery and we do nothing by taking action about it, that's no one's fault but your own. And you're choosing to suffer. And a lot of this time, that's the mindset that stops us from trying to go after it, whatever it is that we want. And that's a pretty heavy story. <laughs> But another story I want to share with you, which I hope that you guys can take something away from this as well, is back to being authentic. And like Rob said, if you would Google my name, Hannah Eden, and you hit images, every single image that comes up, I have bright red hair, like fire truck red hair. And it was definitely, and my, my guy's here, my red realtor somewhere in his red suit. At the beginning, I had a dream that I wanted to have red hair. And that was my decision that I made for myself. That's authentic, right? Then I built this brand, which ends up blowing up pretty quickly on social media, having these opportunities to work with these other big brands. It was all based on the fact that Hannah's real. She doesn't give a fuck. She talks about crotch sweat. She owns the fact that she's got boogers hanging out of nose. She doesn't give a shit what people think about her. I took that and was like, yeah, that's right. That's everything that I am. I'm so authentic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Continue to build. We make millions of dollars. We get to travel, see the world, blah, 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 blah. Until I had my, one of my last jobs with Nordic Track, we were in um, Bora Bora. And call time is like 4 a.m. You've got to be up, ready, hair and makeup. And when you're running around the world like that, there's not a hair and makeup team with you. You're responsible for doing it yourself. And my hair that was red was falling out in clumps in my hands. To the point that if there's, which there are lots of ladies in here, hair is a big deal. All right, I had hair like this on the back of my head. I'd go under here, there'd be clumps. And this is my natural hair now. My entire, oh shit, I just pulled my earring out. My entire hair was like this. Everything had fallen out. So here I am as this fitness professional that is being ranked as like top influencer and this, that, and the other. But yet I am poisoning my head and putting this bleach into my scalp that's literally making my head bleed. I'm crying myself to sleep every night because I have s such low self-esteem. I'm waking up at 1 a.m. because call time's at 4 to try and figure out a way to hide the fucked up hair in the back with fake this, fake that. And I'm like, hang on. I had this massive low and I sat there in my shit and I was like, this is not authentic. Now I am trying to curate my life to look a certain way, to seek the approval of others, because that's what I've told myself has gotten me to this amount of success. And that's gonna lead me to my last point. We each, and this is science, we each have 60 to 70,000 thoughts that go through our mind a day. We get to choose what thoughts go in there. But if we're constantly living in an old story, that we've told ourselves or that someone told ourselves or that we truly believe, whether that's, oh, I can't do that because I'm not this, or I can't do that because I'm not this. Oh no, this runs in my family, so I can't do that. That's all bullshit. So take those out, put new thoughts in, and watch what happens. Because if we continuously live in memories from the past, then there will not be any future. So you guys are all here trying to seek something to take that next step forward. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. So ask yourself and listen to the narrative that you're telling yourself every day. What is it? If it's negativity, you're not gonna go anywhere. And if these thoughts that are positive or brave or risky don't come to you naturally, then find an app that pops up on your phone and will remind you how fucking brilliant you are every time of the day. And the more and more we do these things, the more naturally our brain will produce those thoughts or then that comes with confidence and that comes with ne the next choice that you make and that comes with what do you do when shit hits the fan on black friday or when the gym doesn't take as quickly as you think it's going to be in these lows that's when our mind comes into play and our mind is the only thing that holds us back from being a billionaire from having this from being on this stage versus being in a seat right the only that we're all here We've all got the same body parts. The only difference is this. And we can control that. It's hard, 
Do you think I wanted to get up and finish the bike? No, but I tested my mind on that journey. The more and more I focused on the negative, the worse I would feel. The more and more I would literally lie to myself and had a very strict rule amongst the group of people that were there to support, which is don't ever ask me if I'm okay. Because if you ask me if I'm okay, I'm gonna go, yeah, why, am I not? And then all of a sudden that thought of like doubt seeps into my mind. Then there's more and more of a chance that I don't want to finish today. I'm cold, I'm not feeling good. I am bleeding on my legs or my back is so fucked up I can't even stand up straight. I'm walking everywhere like this trying to finish this, this mission. So the words that we tell ourselves, what we actually say out loud is so important. So change the way you talk to yourself, change the way that you look at yourself. And if it's not something that happens naturally, figure out a way for it to become a habit because those habits will become you. They say it takes 21 days to create a habit, right? So do something for 21 days. Move your body and move your mind and move your spirit. And your mind is where you can focus on meditation. And this is my last point and then I'll leave. Sorry, I feel like I'm taking up a lot of time. I am not done with this self-actualization. And I kept telling myself, which was a story, that I have tested my mind by doing these crazy things and running and doing all these things and yada, yada, yada. But what I realized as I have been in some lows recently, it's been a really challenging year in business. We moved states, we're renovating a house, which is all beautiful, but it's come along with a lot of challenges. And in these lows, I'm like, okay, Hannah, you're a doer. You need to find more discipline. You're a, I am disciplined, but there's always more. So I'm like, you can never sit still. The pandemic showed you that. So you're gonna to commit to meditating. And I used to think that meditation was a bunch of bullshit, and I'll be honest with you. Turns out it isn't. It's the hardest thing that I have in my life. To sit still for 15 minutes, and now I'm working my way up to 20, to 25, to 30, is so hard. And here's one thing I will share that changed my meditation practice, which is I'm like, there sitting down, trying to be all zen and like, heart rate's really high. I'm like, fuck, I've got to send an email. Oh my gosh, I've got to do this. Oh my gosh, I've got to do all these thoughts. I'm like, this isn't meditating. And then their mentor told me, no, that's exactly what meditation is. It's every time that you recognize that your mind starts to wander, but you can bring it back to this place of center. And my God, I don't realize the effects of the meditation until something in life happens. And you look at yourself and you're like, oh shit, how did I manage to not react how I thought I was gonna react there? Or how was I actually managed to think before I spoke? Or how was I able to see a different perspective than what doesn't come to me naturally? And it's through just exercising and you open up these different parts of your brain. So if you're not meditating, do it. That's my biggest tool to build discipline. And yours might be different. Yours might be, I think discipline is something that goes across the board, which is if the way you do one thing is the way you do everything, right? If you say you're gonna do something, do it. If you say you're gonna get up at 4 a.m., get up at 4 a.m. or don't say you're gonna do it. Because every time, every time you don't do something that you say you're gonna do, your discipline is coming further and further and further down. So don't commit unless you're ready. Don't overspeak unless you're ready. And maybe that means not watching porn for 30 days. Could be pretty hard. Maybe it means playing with your children without your phone for 30 minutes, undistracted and be present. Do it 100%. Try it out for 21 days. Second part, moving your body. You don't need to run around the country of Iceland. You don't need to do all that extreme stuff. You don't need to be a DLB. You don't need to be a Christian. Get up and walk. Progressive overload. Progressively overload the exertion that you're putting your body through every single day. And you'll get closer and closer to where you want to be. And then finally, spirit. Ask yourself what it is that you want. What really like hikes your skirt up? What gets you going? What is it that gets you off in, in a way that makes you feel fulfilled, but also motivates you and is a dream or a goal that is your own? The dream or goal is what you're gonna chase after. And the fulfillment part is what you're gonna, that's your secret weapon. That's what you're gonna whip out whenever times get tough. Because if you're really trying to go after what all these guys have done, that shit's hard. And they say it's easy, that's because he's in that self-actualization mindset. But how do you get from level one to level five? By executing and consistency. So thank you guys for listening. I hope that I could have shared something that inspired you guys in some way, shape or form. And a massive shout out to Rob and to Keaton. Thank you guys so much.